Hi, everybody. Hi. Uh, I'd like to introduce you to someone. This is Quick. Um, Quick has a problem. Quick is a puppy from the Netherlands. And uh, I don't necessarily believe that the, the creator of Quick's Bowl intended Quick to be having this problem, but nonetheless, um, Quick thinks the bone in the bottom of his bowl is real. So Quick right here is really illustrating for us uh, trompe which is what I'm here to talk to you about today. The idea that a two-dimensional piece of art is uh, perceived as having three dimensions. Translated directly from the French, we're actually looking at the phrase deceives the eye, which I really like, just the, the idea of that sort of deceit, and it, it, it fills me with a certain sense of joy. Um, when we talk about this in the context of our history, there's a whole bunch of other words that go with it, but I'm just gonna stick with the deception of the eye as being the part of this that I really love. So we're gonna get right into that. Um, we typically think of this style of art coming into great effect during the course of the Baroque period, but it was actually in play in European art much earlier than that, going all the way back to Greece, ancient Greece. Uh, Pliny tells a story of Zeuxis and Parahesis and Zeuxis was an artist who painted some grapes. Probably not these specific grapes, these are from a mural in Pompeii, but you know, they're illustrative. So Zeuxis's grapes were gorgeous. Birds were rumored to come from the sky to try and eat his grapes. They were so beautiful, and he was lauded for this and lifted up as being this amazing artist. And, and Parahesis came to him and said, Zeuxis, I, your, your grapes are so amazing, and I would really love it if you could come and judge a painting of mine. I would really like get some positive quality feedback on this. And Zeuxis acknowledged this, uh, his greatness, and said, yes, of course, I will bring my greatness to come and look at your painting. So Parhesis leads him to where his art is, and Zeuxis goes to push back the curtain to reveal the painting underneath. Only the painting is the curtain. The, the curtain is the painting. Uh, Parhesis painted a curtain and faked Zeuxis out with it. This is an a engraving from the Netherlands from the 17th century of that particular uh, historical deception. Zeuxis was then reported to say, Zeuxis may have fooled the birds, but Parhesis has fooled Zeuxis. So. <laughs> Art in Europe in the medieval period tended to be more religious and symbolic, so we lost some of the sort of realism that was present with the, the Greek artists in the ancient period. But in the, the course of uh, moving forward towards the Baroque period and moving into the Renaissance, um, artists, even in the religious style, were starting to bring some of the trompe l'oeil effect into their art, which you can really see here in this enunciation diptych. And I actually have this from two angles because it's just kind of like, crazy amazing how good it is even as you move around it. And you can see here that the religious symbols are still being painted with that real depth to them. And I promise this is a painting. This is not some carved statues hanging out in the middle of the frame. The, the physical frame and the painted frame really blend together in this beautiful way. You also see this coming forward in some portraiture. I might actually be standing in front of the effect right now, so I'm gonna zoom in on this. But you can see here there's a, a person in a painted frame, and at the very bottom of that frame, there's a fly kind of just hanging on the frame, painted fly hanging on the frame. So that fly has been given a lot of credit over time. Uh, it's maybe a representation of Satan. It's maybe the artist showing off because it's a pretty cool fly. But it's also creating that sense of space between us and the painting. This fly is really part of what we're doing. It's not part of what's in the painting itself. So as we move more towards the Baroque period, we get into what people now will refer to as the first of the more modern trompe l'oeil paintings. So smaller scale, like size that you could probably hang in your house, secular subjects, getting back into that sort of realism, that, that idea that you're painting something that is, is physically present in the world. And so this is part of the story of what it, some people will call the first sort of modern secular trompe l'oeil painting. And you might be looking at this right now and, and being like, okay, Barbara, but where's the zoom in? Because I kind of don't see it. Like, it's pretty and all, but no, the no 3D, right? So we're going to actually zoom out on this because it turns out if you take this painting, which you can see at the Getty if you go visit Los Angeles, and um, this painting, which is in Venice, Italy, and stick them together, you have one giant painting and that was separated at some point. And tune in tomorrow on Something Weird, the Facebook group, where I will be giving you more information about the mysterious third panel that might exist with this painting. But you still might be looking at this like, okay, so it's still a pretty good painting, but I kind of don't see it. Like, am I not getting it? And the tr 
trick here is actually you have to turn over that first panel to see the art that I'm talking about. So this is a letter board, which is pretty common, and we'll see a number of them coming up in the Trump Loyal style. It's, it's a flat surface that has some pieces that project out of it, so it's an easy way to start to depict this particular format. And people think it's the first one. People also will call this one the first one, even though it came later. I'm not really sure why that is, though the theory that some people put forward is that since the other one's on the back of something, it doesn't count. That really works unless you consider that this one probably also started its life on the back of something. I don't know. So we've got two firsts um, of a style that people were already using. So Trump loyal stirred up on the back of things a lot. Um, this little memento mori was painted onto the back of a diptych, a portrait diptych. And it just really delights me to think of all of these things, these artists showing off these great skills and sort of putting them on the back of things. Like we're, we're bringing out some real art here, like some real skill, some, some labor, some perspective, some effort into these things. And, and they just sort of tucked them away, hidden, hidden behind things. But as we move more firmly into the Baroque period in art, you start to see them coming forward as the front of paintings. And that letter board is coming up as being pretty popular. We see a number of those. It's a pretty easy way to show off this kind of flashy newish thing. But it's not the only way that people were using the style. You can see here in this painting by Vermeer, the curtain itself is removed from the subject of the painting and it's more part of our experience of it, which becomes more clear if you see it in the frame hanging on the wall. At the time, artists in the Netherlands would hang curtains in front of their paintings to sort of do the reveal and show off the painting. And this, paint, this painted curtain almost looks ready for you to sort of reach and tuck it back down to sort of to hide the painting back again. And while a number of artists would use this format a couple of times here and there, some artists really got into it. This painting is titled A Trompe l'Oeil of an Open Glazed Covered Door with Numerous Papers and Objects, and it was painted in 1666 by Cornelius Norbertus Hisbrechts. Hisbrechts was really into this style. He was really, really, <laughs> really into it. Which I'm really happy about because it means he painted the next painting I'm going to show you, which is my favorite thing that I'm going to show you all night. <clears throat> this is the reverse of a framed painting, painted sometime between 1668 and 1672. And all I can think when I look at this painting is I would have loved to have this guy over for dinner. <laughs> It just, how fun is this? Like, you know, people are out there painting like crazy elaborate portraits and these incredibly gorgeous still lights and he's like, no, I'm gonna paint the back of a painting. <laughs> painting that you would hang on the wall is not the only place we see trompe l'oeil effects. This, this is something you've probably seen before. It's one of the most famous trompe l'oeil ceilings in the world. This is a Jesuit church in Vienna and Andrea Pozzo painted this in 1703. This church was originally intended to have a huge vaulted ceiling, like, like crazy huge. They, they wanted this, but real, not painted. There's a Dominican library that was next door at the time, and the Dominicans went to the Jesuits, and they were like, guys, uh, so about your giant vaulted ceiling you want to put in your church that has a giant roof that has to go with it? Yeah, so it blocks the light to our library, and we would um, have a really hard time reading in the dark. Would you mind not doing that? So the Jesuits, kindly did not put their giant roof on the building and block the light of the Dominicans. So um, they hired somebody to paint it instead to get that same, same sort of grand effect. And having personally encountered a trompe l'oeil ceiling, this is um, a, a ceiling of a room in Venice, Italy. And this faked me out for about an hour before I realized that it's all paint up there, not actually architectural detail. So those, those ceilings really have a, can have a profound effect and can be really delightful. And while trompe l'oeil really fell out of main favor, it, was, it had sort of a, a flash where it was hugely popular and you were seeing lots of those letter boards everywhere. It didn't entirely ever go away. And there was a resurgence in the United States in the late 1800s that was led in part by William Harnett, who was an Irish-American artist. And you can actually see this painting at the Legion of Honor in San Francisco. This is part of his After the Hunt series. He did a number of these. Uh, trompe l'oeil really continues on even more so in more sort of modern decorative arts. We also see it a lot in murals. This is a John Pugh mural that you can see at the Fremont Aquatic Park, so also local. We see it in tattoos. We see it in sidewalk truck art. And it hasn't entirely left what one would consider the fine arts either. You do still see it coming forward in painted art in a number of different places. 
So I would hope for this evening that all of our artists could escape some criticism and that all of you were able to experience a little bit of the same wonder of Quick, our puppy from the beginning. And I would like to leave you with a brief quote from Dante. In front there was a throng of seven choirs, depicted causing strife between two senses. One saying no, the other yes they sing. So with the clouds of incense they were rendered, so that my vision and my sense of smell came into conflict over yes and no. Thank you.